all the self-help books that are written for masses of people don't always work. One may catch you and hit on your problem, you may recognize it and it may help you. But there is no one master plan that will make it with everybody. What's important is to find the specific issues with which you're involved. And very often, they're not in consciousness. They're unconscious to us. So Jung talked about consciousness as being the sphere of the ego that is the ego being the center of consciousness or the organ of consciousness that kind of runs consciousness and the unconscious which uh, consists of everything that we don't know about that we're not conscious about that we're not aware of now these are not two different spaces uh, cut off from one another I rather like to think of consciousness and the unconscious as foreground and background. That is, what we're aware of, what we're conscious of at any given time is foreground, and the rest of it is in the background. And sometimes that searchlight of the ego shifts, and the con consciousness focuses on one thing or on another, and all that it isn't focusing on is unconscious. But if we use the metaphor of a searchlight again, uh, we might think of ourselves in a great forest, and we can illuminate this tree or that bush or this area, but there will always be the great proportion of the space dark. And so with the human awareness, we're, we have a certain amount of it, but there is always and always will be much more than we can ever encompass. And this is where Jung parts company with the ego psychologist who believe that we can somehow make the unconscious conscious and that when we've incorporated all of the unconscious into consciousness that then we will uh, relieve ourselves from our, our repression that we really know what's going on inside of us. Jungians don't believe that. They believe that they're on the brink, on the edge of a great darkness, uh, a great mystery, and that we can illuminate it only up to a certain point, that we must respect it, and that we can utilize its power and its energy if we're in harmony with it, but we can't run it, we can't rule it. And so here again, the Jungian approach is different from many other psychological <coughs> approaches. And I think that essentially, this is probably the reason why Jungian psychology appeals so much to people who are committed to a spiritual existence. Because those people know that we can only see so far into the divine mysteries of life. And that beyond that, there is required faith and trust and receptivity. Will has an important place in helping to recognize unconscious material that comes to us and put it into our lives. But again, will is not sufficient. We need will power. Now, I'm not using this in the ordinary sense of determination, but I'm using it in the sense of that power that comes from being in touch with the, with the forces that are operating, which motivate us, which give us guidance, which give us direction. To really be able to listen to that. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, the town may be changed, but the well cannot be changed. This is very beautiful. Because the town could very well be said to represent the ego. The that which we build, and we can build it here, we can build it there, but the well 
on which the town de depends goes deep into the earth and it taps into sources of water that we don't know where they come from, we don't know where they go to. But that is a given. And that is what Jung meant by the unconscious. And when we build our town on our will, when we build our life structure on the depth of reality, then we can be sure that it will be well-founded and well-grounded. Now, Jung explored the unconscious in his way at a time when not many people were doing it. It was a very frightening territory. Today, people explore, they take uh, drugs, they go into meditation. It's not unusual to explore unconscious areas. Uh, Jung did it uh, at a time when it was very frightening, when only a few people had even recognized that there was such an area. And he went deep into himself without any drugs, without any traditional kind of meditation. He did it mostly through his own dreams, through exploring his own dreams, through some uh, visions of the imagination that came to him, through some inner dialogue, and he began to map this area. Now, when I say map it, I don't mean to say that he uh, said this is here and this is there, but he tried to, uh, he built the kind of internal structure and talked about a great deal. The way he talked about it was the only way you can talk about the unconscious, because you don't really know it, and he talked about it metaphorically. So when I talk to you about the unconscious, I'm also talking metaphorically. Jung talked about archetypes. Archetypes is a word that is pretty familiar today, but in the Jungian sense, it's not so easy to explain. The archetypes were kind of structures in the unconscious psyche. Uh, ways in which people tended to see things. One quality of the archetype is that it's ubiquitous. It's all over the world. Everybody sees it in these particular ways, particular forms. And it's also not bound, the archetype is also not bound by time. Uh, one experiences the same archetypes that our ancestors experienced. So, for example, the archetype of the of the evildoer, the shadow, the dark person, the antichrist, the uh, the devil. This dark, unknown, powerful element, in some form or shape, has always been with a uh, human being, from the earliest primitives who perceive dark forces in the forest to today when we see another nation, for example, that's not doing things the way we approve of as being the embodiment of evil. So the shadow uh, was what Jung called this particular archetype. Another archetype is the archetype of the contrasexual. That is to say, the awareness within us of the opposite sex and the image within us that we carry of the opposite sex. So I, as a woman, would have within me a masculine image or a masculine potential, a repressed, possibly masculine element. Uh, that would be called the archetype of the animus, coming from the Latin word for soul, which, of course, is in the feminine gender, anima, because... Uh, it began to be used for men talking about their feminine counterparts. So the anima and the anima represent another archetype. The idea of the mother, the great mother, the eternal mother, uh, is another archetype that people experience uh, within themselves uh, as they view the world and their mother figures, whether they're institutions like the church, 
or whether they might be a teacher or a friend, an older friend, the great mother archetype comes up very often. So these archetypes are very generalized forms, and each culture uh, puts its own content into the archetype, so that the mother image in one culture might be very different from the mother image in another culture. And bringing it down even more to the personal, we all have personal experiences of these archetypes. I've only given you a very few. Uh, there are many of them. In fact, the pagan gods, the Greek gods, for example, have been cited as images of archetypes. Uh, Hera, for example, the uh, wife of Zeus, uh, is thought of as related to the archetype of marriage. And Athena relates to the archetype of wisdom, and so on. So that you can imagine that psychologically, people could identify with one or another archetype. They could be living that out in their lives. Or they could have several of them that function within them as sub-personalities and aspects uh, of themselves. So we experience the archetype then as an image uh, to which we're related and one that sometimes controls our functioning. Well, if you have all of these archetypes in you, you're almost living in kind of polytheism. It's an interesting idea. Uh, sometimes comes up in Jungian psychology. The idea that we have all these gods and goddesses at war within ourselves. And of course, again, I'm talking very metaphorically. These are images of characteristic qualities, ways of being, which... Uh, often uh, in the unconscious are struggling for domination of our psyche. The ego, too, has structures, not only the unconscious. And the ego structures you have talked about in terms of types of people, psychological types. And there's a very interesting uh, realm of Jungian psychology which deals with typology. There are, according to Jung, uh, two basic attitudes, introversion or extroversion, terms which I'm sure are familiar to all of you, though not everyone may know that Jung originated them. But uh, he claimed that people <coughs> tended to be either more introverted or more extroverted. And so his way of understanding people in terms of their types, and there are other types too, which I won't go into now, help people to understand why they look at the world differently from the way other people look. It's a very useful idea uh, to know that your ego is structured this way and somebody else's ego is structured another way, so that when you look at an issue and another person looks at an issue, it's not necessarily my way and the wrong way, but uh, there are different perspectives. And we can learn how people tend to function according to their own typology. It's very helpful, for instance, in marriage counseling uh, to know that people can have a very difficult time together because they're different types. And one sees a, a, a situation one way and the other sees the situation another way, and they just can't get together. If they really would understand typology, they would know that one sees one side of the situation, the other sees the other side, and if they would pool their efforts instead of fighting about who's right, they would soon have a much fuller picture in which both could share. And that's just one of the contributions of typology. Uh, I want to talk about something that's very important in Jungian psychology. As I said, I, I feel like a kind of satellite hovering over, uh, trying to give you a weather report, <laughs> get a long distance view of a cloud here and a cloud there. 
but I'm not really trying to teach you anything. I'm trying to give you a sense, a feel of what this is all about. Uh, you know, like when you go to Europe in 17 days and see 18 countries, you find out whether you want to go back or not. <laughs> and if you do, where you want to stop and stay longer next time. So here's a place you might want to stay for a while. It has to do with what Jung called the ego self axis. Ego, as we said, is the center of consciousness, the center of awareness. It's that switchboard that kind of plugs things in, puts things together, and tells us what time to get up in the morning and how to do our job and all that sort of thing. Now, the self is what Jung thought of as the center of the totality of the psyche, that is, the, the consciousness and the unconscious combined. So, <laughs> if this is the conscious part of the psyche, and this is the unconscious, which really stretches out into infinity, the ego is in consciousness, and it really operates here, and it mediates between consciousness and the world. But the self is the center of the whole psyche, and it both mediates between the unconscious and consciousness through the ego. So, the self, then, is the real center of our being. It's where we, where the ego gets its direction when it listens. And when it doesn't listen, it often gets uh, very much disturbed because we're not working with our deepest selves. The self can be thought of in two ways. As the center of I think of the self as the center of my psyche, my unconscious, my consciousness. And I can also think of it as being connected with the universe. That is, it's that part of the universal consciousness, the divine will, if you want to put it in those terms, which I experience within myself. So we have self I like to differentiate it. Self with a small f, meaning myself, my center, and self with a large s, that human being, and uh, begin to find our way in the world, first in the family, and then in the school, and then out in the world, and establish ourselves as human beings. And a person with an identity, a place in the sun, all that. Those are ego tasks, and they're usually the main tasks of the first half of life. It's almost necessary for us to know who we are from the ego standpoint, to have a, a sense of identity, a, a self-image, a, a sense of competence. Before we begin asking the, the question, is this all there is? I've made it all right. I've gotten myself established in school or in work or in my family. But isn't there more? How am I connected with that great universe outside of myself? And what can I do in connection with it to make that connectedness and that reality uh, more personal? And so with Jung, we go beyond the personal crises and personal problems to issues of uh, ultimate reality, that we face them insofar as we're capable and try to, to find a relationship between ourselves and those kinds of realities. In that sense, Jung is probably the father of what's today being called transpersonal psychology because we do get beyond individual issues and we do get beyond personal. We go from the small self to the larger self. And this large self also is an archetype. 
that is, it's a, something of which people can become aware. And it's present, at least in potential, in everybody. Now, what are some of the images of the self? How does it show itself? Young, being a Christian, said that the image of Christ, the awareness of Christ, as a symbol of the self or an image of the self, was one way in which this greater self manifested itself to human beings. That here was the image par excellence of that God beyond or that self beyond that one cannot really see, that, one, that, that doesn't have human form, that can't be uh, contacted uh, as directly. Uh, other images of the self, perhaps a figure such as Buddha would be seen in that light. Or the Kabbalistic image, the Aim Self in Hebrew, which was the what was called the divine presence, uh, which really had no name, the ineffable presence. The the mandala, the circle design, which symbolizes centrality and yet radiates out in all directions. This is another image of itself, the rose window in the cathedral, but there's still more uh, specific image of that. There is a uh, saying that illustrates the transpersonal nature of Jungian psychology. And I want to just preface it with the statement that, that you hear so much today about uh, narcissism in psychology and how people, this is the me decade and everybody's concerned with me, 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 and, and uh, doing things for myself and finding myself and being myself and it's good for me, so go ahead. Uh, and maybe that's necessary that we become self-aware. But Jungian psychology accepts that and goes beyond it at the same time. <laughs> the statement, of, again, a, a rabbinical statement, goes like this. If I am not for myself, who shall be for me? But if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? This last, if not now, when? is really the clincher, because it suggests that it isn't enough to have this consciousness, but now that you know it, what are you going to do about it? What you're going to do about it, and which Jung urged everyone to do about it, is to act on it in the world. I know I don't even have to say that to you people here, because this beautiful center is such an example of acting on beliefs and making a place where people can come and share their ideas and serve one another. And I must say again that I'm just very, very happy to be here. Let's say a little bit about uh, analysis because it somehow describes the spirit of Jungian ideas. I want to talk about the relationship of the analyst and the analysand. You notice I use the term analyst and not patient, not client. It's not the analyst is not somebody who does something to somebody. There's a relationship. And it's through the relationship that something happens. And what is it that we want to happen? Well, we want to make our little stab at organizing chaos. That's a heavy project. But we all experience chaos at times. It's healthy to do that. Now, things get mixed up. If they didn't, it would be static and get molded. But uh, sometimes we need to organize it. We need to talk about it. We need to share it. We need to, to think it through and feel it through and sense it through. And we need someone to guide in this process. And people ask, is it ever finished? Do you ever finish an analysis? Well, 
you may finish the formal part of it. I've been at it now uh, almost 20 years, and I'm far from finished. I think it's kind of like an education. When you begin to know about something, you think, well, pretty soon I'm going to know all there is to know about it. But when you study more about it, you find, well, I'm not so sure I'm ever going to know all about it. And when you become a real expert, you know how little you really know. Well, this process of relating to your inner self, to your own will, and also to the world outside, is one that you never really complete. But it's a quest. And your ability to do it, and the richness that you can draw from it, increases through the ages. And so as you get older, you begin to get a greater sense of that relationship. You begin to integrate all the bits and pieces of your being. You don't feel so pregnant. You don't feel so practical. You begin to have a sense of how all the things that you do are really related to everything that you do and everything that you think has a significance. The relationship between the analyst and the analysis could be a paradigm for other kinds of relationships, too. First of all, the Jungian analysis is a face-to-face relationship. There's no couch. There is no uh, sense of one being superior and the other being inferior. Uh, there are two people facing each other and sharing. The analyst shares also, not just the analysis. Both learn in the process, and both are changed by the process. Otherwise, it isn't worth very much. I guess one of the reasons that I like this profession so much is that every time my door opens, I never know just what uh, is going to happen, what problem, what issues, what uh, concerns, what insights are going to be dropped in my lap. And so often, I'm enriched. I, uh, I, I really feel that it's a profession in which there can be as much growth on the part of the analyst as on the analysis. Another thing about union analysis, the analyst approaches the analysis with no presumption. If I saw somebody last week and had a view when that person left, I don't necessarily feel that that same person is going to come back the next week with the, uh, the same kind of material, the same kind of uh, approach, that this is really, each time that person comes, there's something new, there's some body new, that person has been changed, and I'm open to that change, and don't carry with me the, uh, the relics of the past relationship. And I think this kind of experience is something that doesn't just happen in analysis, but that all of us, as we go out and meet people that we've seen before, our children, our spouses, our friends, that we cannot carry the past with us and remember what they're like and relate to our memory. But we must have that, that openness that we learn when we view each person as when we're seeing uh, him or her for the first time. Unless we become as a little child. The analyst tries to follow the energy of the unconscious. When I'm working with someone, we may be talking about something, and I see the conversation will drift a little bit, and things get a little dull, and then I might mention something, and all of a sudden, the person will perk up and show an interest in it, and sit forward, and then I know I've hit something. And I don't care what I had on my agenda. Let's go with that, where the energy is. See what's feeding that, and maybe I'm tapped into the well. I think that can happen in all relationships. If you perceive where people are hooked, where they're moving, where there's uh, involvement and go with it. Well, if it's such a mutual process, you might ask then, what is the difference between the analyst and the analysis? Well, in a way, you know, all analysts were analysis. 
So the difference is not as great as you might think. The analyst has to go through a long period of training, which began with a personal analysis, which is just like anybody else's personal analysis. You don't begin with a training analysis in Jungian psychology. You go in because you want to understand yourself, what makes you think, what makes you go, where your well is, and only after you've done that, and if out of that it develops that your way of being in the world is to be a Jungian analyst. Then you might have the opportunity to train. But if it doesn't work out that way, why well, can do something else? And it's equally uh, honorable, maybe more so, than being a Jungian analyst. <laughs> so uh, what is the difference between the analyst and the analyst? Well, the analyst has been over the road, has traveled the path for a while, and maybe knows the territory a little bit. Uh, it's gone a little further along. It's a saying among analysts that you can't take anybody any further than you've gone yourself. So the analyst, too, has to be constantly working on herself or himself, uh, seeing what's going on, uh, enlarging the capacity of dealing with unconscious material. The analyst, like the analysis, has experienced the pain of the process of dredging up and clarifying uh, the difficulties, the problems, the embarrassment, the shame, the guilt, facing his or her own darkness quietly and alone and also in confrontation with another human being, as you all know, is very different from doing it alone. The analyst doesn't expect anybody to do what he or she hasn't done himself. And I think that that's true, that should be true for anyone who works with people. If you don't give out advice uh, to do this or do that, uh, if it's not something that you yourself have been able to master or to deal with. I think that what's specific about Jungian analysis, what's perhaps different from any other kind that I know of, is the way in which it gives an equal place to the unconscious as to consciousness. That is to say that the unconscious can be seen as either the pit of hell, the deepest darkness that anybody could possibly experience, or else, it can also be seen as the wellspring of creation. That is, the source material out of which something can be built, something can be grown. It's like the primordial dust out of which God fashioned Adam. It was nothing but earth, and yet it was the source material with the divine inspiration that made it possible in our a tradition for human beings to be created. So we deal with the unconscious and give it due respect. And one of the ways we do it is in uh, trying to understand our dreams. That's an essential part of Jungian work. Another way we do it is through a process called active imagination in which the unconscious is engaged in a dialogue of some kind. It might be a, a verbal dialogue. It might be uh, through the medium of an art form, of drawing or music or dance, but some way of opening oneself up for unconscious process to take place and for the insight of the unconscious to get through the barriers that we usually erect to keep ourselves functioning in the everyday world. So that's a whole other process, which is uh, important if we get into a relationship with the unconscious. And the third way, which I think is very bad, is through our own creative production. Uh, through what we 
give from ourselves up to the world in our past. What we do that comes not from books and not from uh, programmed learning, but which comes from our own depth and our own experience and which we can let flow out of us without too much structure into a creative project. So where does the Jungian way lead? Well, it leads to finding, hopefully, the true expression of who we are, that is, that archetypal pattern on which our psyche is, is based. It, it's a way of learning to live with people in the world, and it's a way of learning to live with our many selves which we all possess, and to find some sort of harmony with those many selves. It's a way of discovering the monism, the unity, that's behind the polytheism <coughs> of uh, life as it appears to us, the many different ways of, of identifying ourselves and valuing ourselves. You see that, that one basic, ultimate, reality which supersedes all the little bits and pieces. It's a, a movement from chaos to diversity and then from diversity to ordering and then from ordering to a sense of wholeness. It's a process of integrating as we get older instead of disintegrating as we see so many people do. And all this is buttressed by what I began talking about, the self-regulating power of the psyche. It's all there. It's all available. We just have to learn how to tap it. We have to be active in doing it, but we have to, to go with it, to go with the brain and not against it. I think that's all I want to say to you now. I think I've put a lot out there, and I'm sure it's not clear. I didn't want to give you a nice wrapped up package today. If I stimulated you to think, that's really all I want to do, to reflect, to ask yourself, is this a way of looking at life that that I can do, who I feel comfortable with. <coughs> and I think that we can take a few minutes, if you like, to uh, talk about some questions you might have or some observations, um, whatever you like. So. Please. I was wondering, you talked about how there's a certain basic well that you first that you talked about a person coming in one session and then another session and you wanted to assume that it had to change the great deal. And that's really what there's all of those things. Yes. Um, the basic structures are there. <coughs> but how we, how we live in the world is constantly changing. Uh, we have just many, many potentialities. And so we're always functioning one way, functioning another way, influenced by different things. We don't really always relate to that basic stuff. And so while there is a continuity, just as there is a continuity in our sense of who we are, yet there's constant change over time. And I think it's, it's what I'm trying to, to emphasize is that we have to recognize the change, to see that person freshly and not the way he was. Yes. Dreams are a very important part of our 
part of your needs analysis because dreams uh, are something that are not constructed by this ego up here, but they come straight from the unconscious, and the ego manages to catch a little bit and hang on to it. And you all know when you dream that you have a sense that you know, I have some of it, but most of it I lost somewhere along the line. Uh, being able to get in touch with that dream material and to understand it as the speech of the unconscious and to try to, to work your way through to some sense of the meaning of it is one of the important things that we do in your analysis. Uh, this is a, I purposely didn't get into it very much because one could spend weeks and months uh, talking about dreams. Uh, someday you might want to have a course about things. But uh, I uh, can't go into it more than that at this time. Yes. It's as though this <coughs> self with a small s is the, the imminent presence. That is the sense within ourselves, within us, that we have of the great mystery. But the <coughs> self with the large s is the rest of it, the part that's transcendent, the part that we cannot directly encompass. We can only encompass that which we experience. Yes. Self is small as. Does that help a little? Thank you. Would that be uh, like in Hinduism, the Atman and the Brahman? It would be comparable, yes. Yes. Thank you. That does help. Yes. Does it like you don't involve the other also simultaneously? Wish to dissolve, like Freud said in the, the other pleasure principle. <coughs> also, wish to self destruct and dissolve simultaneously with trying to be complete and total. Uh, there is a sense of that sometimes, too, that there is always a dynamic going. If, if it could ever be complete, things would be static, things would, would wind down. But there is always a process of of coming to a certain resolution of the problem and then a new problem involved or new issues. So there is always this dynamic process. You're in the process of a uh, lifelong individuation. Is this what we all are uh, trying to achieve in this union between ego and God and the self? I would how does it make you feel? This is what I really want to say. How does it make you feel? physical, emotional difference does it make when you have some wisdom and I really admire you both so much and I just wanted to ask you that what, is, what practical sense does it give you? Well, it's a strange thing. I uh, certainly am on the path like everyone else and really turn yourself inside out and suffer a great, great deal. And then maybe you would, in time, have an inkling of what it was all about. Um, I thought at the time that that might be true, but it also might be a slight exaggeration. And it was at that time that I in my innocence as a student, uh, asked the question, why doesn't somebody uh, write a kind of simple book explaining what a Jungian analysis is like? What it's like to get into the feeling of the Jungian way of doing things, of uh, the Jungian way of approaching life. What that's like? And uh, people said to me, no, you can't do that. It's much too complicated and you really have to go through it uh, like going into a mine and digging it out from the very depths of the earth. Uh, I wasn't altogether convinced, but there wasn't too much I could do about it at the time. 
And after I had come back to Chicago and been in analytic practice for around 10 years, I decided to do the thing that they said couldn't be done. And so I wrote a simple book, relatively simple, called Boundaries of the Soul, in which I tried to explain the essence of uh, what happens in Jungian therapy or Jungian analysis from the point of view of the therapist, how I saw it, what I saw happening to people, how they changed, uh, how I changed, because I think I changed as much as anybody in the process. Uh, that took a couple of years to do, and so here I am now, a few years later, with about an hour to talk with you and try somehow to capsulize some important experiences in connection with young thought as it affects the person who studies it, who reads it, who tries to live it. I'm reminded of the story that's told of the Rabbi Hillel, who lived about the time of Jesus and was asked uh, if he could explain, asked by uh, a heathen, if he could explain the essence of Judaism, why the brothers people, while his person uh, could stand on one foot. Uh, people were very patient with philosophy in those days. And so um, he thought a while, and then he said, well, I'll give it a try. He said, do not do unto anyone what you would not have them do unto you. That is the essence of the whole thing. All the rest is commentary. Well, I guess what I'm going to do is try to deal with essence. If you, if you want to explain more, if you want to understand more, if you want to get into it more, if you want to get a sense of it, I know that Poland Time Center has provided some opportunities. We in Chicago and Evanston have established a young center up there which provides uh, lectures, workshops, seminars. A couple of weeks ago we had an outreach program where we tried to reach uh, the psychiatrists of the Chicago area and with many of them did come. And some of our Jungian psychiatrists talked with them about psychiatric implications of Jungian analysis. So we've had that. We've had outreach to clergy, to educators, to social workers. We have there also a library. We grant film having to do with Jung and his life and his work. And we have a training center for Jungian analysts and also uh, a therapy center. Of course, it's a long way to Evanston from here, although some of the people from this community have managed to find their way there. But that center has something that you may wish to participate in. Uh, that's one of the purposes of this meeting tonight. And Mr. Vanderbeek is going to talk with you about the possibility when I finish talking. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about Jungian therapy. You all might have seen the um, ad for Rosen's Rye Bread. There is a picture of an Indian with long braids and a feather in his hat, and the caption is, you don't have to be Jewish to enjoy Rosen's Rye Bread. <laughs> well, if I can edit that, because you don't have to be sick to undergo Jungian treatment or Jungian therapy. And I think that's one of the most interesting and outstanding things about the Jungian approach uh, to analysis, to, uh, to life. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be specifically troubled with a, quote, problem or a crisis. Jungian ideas are based not on sickness but on wellness. Uh, we understand that being well, 
being whole, being healthy, is the natural state of people. And what we're trying to do in Jungian work is to maintain that state, or if somehow it slipped away from us, to regain it, to be back where we belong. Uh, a lot of it is having to do with prevention of psychological problems, uh, preventing getting into a kind of bind where you can't get out of it. Uh, and that has often to do with one's lifestyle, how one uh, goes through the day, how one sees oneself vis-a-vis -vis the world. So the approach that I want to talk about is a very old one. It goes all the way back uh, to yogic philosophy, perhaps. Um, and yet it's very contemporary. It has to do with holistic health, with getting the spiritual and the emotional and the physical and the intellectual aspects of life working together in a harmonious complete way. Now, at the base of all this is what we call the psyche. Psychology comes from the word psyche, so does psychiatry, but most psychologists and most psychiatrists don't talk much about psyche. Psyche is not mind, although it's related to mind. It's not exactly spirit either, but it's, if anything, it's a way in which we perceive ourselves, and a way in which we incorporate the world in which we live. Uh, Jung said that all that I perceive is psychic. That is to say, we perceive it through our own eyes, through our own personal subjective experience the psyche, that indefinable uh, lens before our eyes. Now, according to Jung, the great power of the psyche is that it's self-regulating, that it has the ability to perceive what's out of sync and to compensate for it, uh, to present to the individual all that that individual needs in order to be healthy and to have a sense of, of functioning well and being in tune with his or her environment. It has the ability, the psyche, of letting us know who we are as individuals, as unique human beings, different from anyone else, um, with an inner sort of construction, an inner patterning, which somehow, if we're in tune with it, lets us know what we can do, and how we can do it, and what's the best way, and how to function. That is finding our own inner pattern, and being true to it. Now, one asks, do we really have a pattern? Uh, do we really come into the world with something, or are we... Uh, have them around that to be written upon a blank page in which our experience is right ahead. Jung felt that there was something at the beginning. Now, the Unholy Bible, which Benjamin mentioned, is not a book about the Bible. I will reassure you, I don't think the Bible is unholy, although it might have a few sections. But, um, one of my favorite writers, William Blake, wrote a lot about the Bible, and he looked at it from the underside, that is, from as though someone were coming from hell and looking at the world from below, and he wrote a kind of internal uh, interpretation of the Bible. And uh, uh, I was writing that book about William Blake and his ideas, and so I called it the Unholy Bible. Uh, I want to quote something from Blake now about inner patterning. It's a particularly favorite uh, poem of mine. Of mine. I want to share it with you. 
in what sense is it that the chicken shuns the ravenous hawk? With what sense does the tame pigeon measure out the expanse? With what sense does the bee form cells? Have not the mouse and frog eyes and ears and sense of touch? Yet are their habitations and their pursuits as different as their forms and as their joys? Ask the wild ass why he refuses burden, and the meek camel, why he loves man. Is it because of eye, ear, mouth, or skin, or breathing nostrils? For these the wolf and tiger have. Ask the blind worm, the secrets of the grave, and why her spires love to curl round and round the bones of death. And ask the ravenous snake where she gets poison, and the winged eagle, why he loves the sun. And then, tell me the thoughts of man that have been hid of old. So, you see, even in the animal kingdom, as the poet expressed it, each being has a way of being that was meant for that one, and for that one alone. And we too, according to Jung, have within us a certain potentiality for being a certain kind of person. And if we find it, if we discover it, and we live, not only discover it and know what it is, but live in <coughs> harmony with it, then we begin to get this sense of coolness, this sense of being all together that uh, Jung talks so much about. Now, the psyche is the self-regulating power within us that presupposes a natural wholeness. So if we have the psyche, which is so self-regulating, we might ask ourselves, why am I not feeling whole? It doesn't always seem that way, does it? 